Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about the Indo-Saudi ties and Mohammed bin Salman's latest visit to India. We also talk about an illegal betting app and its promoters who are evading arrest by the Enforcement Directorate. But first, we talk about the Election Commission. In the special session of Parliament that is scheduled for today, one of the bills that has been listed for discussion and passage is the Chief Election Commissioner and other Election Commissioners Bill. This bill proposes to downgrade the service conditions of the three Election Commissioners and in effect threatens to reduce their authority. And this is of course the reason why the Autonomous Election Body and its officials have been opposing it. Now to understand this bill better, Let us first understand what the role of the Election Commission actually is and the kind of powers it has. So the Election Commission, as far as the conduct of elections is concerned, its mandate is to conduct elections in a free and fair manner. This is Indian Express's Ritika Chopra, who writes on the Election Commission for the paper. And uh, the Article 324 of the Constitution essentially gives it sweeping powers to do whatever that needs to be done in order to ensure that elections are free and fair. So in a way, EC has extraordinary powers to conduct elections. And of course, the Commission uses Article 324, which I think if we can call it Commission's Brahmastra, pretty sparingly. But wherever there are grey areas there, the Commission can use Article 324 to take steps for which maybe they are not technically empowered to. But in the name of conducting elections in a free and fair manner, they can do that. So it it does have extraordinary powers and absolute powers. A lot of it that it draws from the Representation of People Act. To give us an example of these sweeping powers, Ritika recalls how during the 2014 Lok Sabha polls, the Commission had banned both BJP leader Amit Shah and SP leader Azam Khan from holding public meetings, processions or roadshows in UP. The EC had done so after observing that both Khan and Shah had been making highly inflammatory speeches during the course of their campaign and were hence violating the model code of conduct. Which essentially, you know, talks about, for instance, not promoting enmity between religions and communities, essentially about how you should conduct yourself even in your speeches. Now, the model code of conduct is not backed by the law, which is why the EC banning Shah and Khan from campaigning was a big deal. Ritika says the commission had done so to create an example for other parties. To send out a strong message that, look, I have this article, it's sort of a source of extraordinary powers and when push comes to shove, I can and I will resort to this. But the reason we're talking about the Election Commission is not because of the powers it draws from Article 324, but because the new bill we talked about earlier, and which is scheduled for discussion in Parliament today, proposes to change the service conditions of the three election commissioners that are part of the body. What do I mean by that? This bill essentially specifies, say, the term of office, you know, the leave rules, salaries, what's the kind of pension that is payable to election commissioners, right? And other conditions of service. So this bill and the act that it proposes to replace is not a law that laid down the powers of the commission, but essentially that how would they transact business? What is the kind of salary they would draw? What would their terms of service be? So that's what this is about. She says that right now the service conditions and the salaries of the three election commissioners are equal to that of a Supreme Court judge. The bill proposes that once passed, the service conditions, the salary and allowance of the chief election commission, election commissioner would be that of a cabinet secretary. Now, why is the spotlight firmly on this provision now recently? Is because we've learned that effectively what this would do while we're talking about downgrade of status, I mean, this is not there in the bill. What former chief election commissioners have told us is that what this would effectively mean in practice is that by virtue of the service conditions, salary and allowance being equal to one of a Supreme Court judge, an election commissioner was perceived to enjoy the stature equal to that of a Supreme Court judge. 
and hence any decision they made any summons they issued again were perceived to have the authority of a supreme court judge if you are to revise the service conditions of an election commissioner to that of a cabinet secretary who is part of the bureaucracy and in the pecking order much below a supreme court judge then that would eventually also affect the authority and stature of or rather the perceived authority and stature of election commissioners ritika says that often during an election season the commission pulls up the bureaucracy and the political class when its directions are not being followed in all such cases it helps if the commission or rather the three election commissioners are perceived to be of a status which is equal to a supreme court judge that those summons those directions those show cause notices or whatever issued carry a different kind of authority and that helps the commission discharge its duties if the service conditions are revised and hence eventually over a period of time they are perceived to be equal to the cabinet secretary who is just the senior most ranking officer in the bureaucracy they said it would be difficult by what authority would they actually summon say a cabinet secretary or a chief secretary or the law secretary for meetings that this would eventually erode their authority is what they are saying that it would be tougher for them to have their writ implemented especially when the moral code of conduct is enforced when they have to conduct elections and they expect the government machinery to also fall in line as per their needs and wants at that point in time so it would be difficult but besides this the other reason that the election commissioner say this bill is problematic is because it also proposes to change the process of how such officials are appointed so as of now the appointments made directly by the government but this bill proposes that there will be a search committee which will be led by the cabinet secretary which will say prepare a short list of candidates and from this short list a final selection will be made by a selection committee which is led by the prime minister and the leader of opposition and a union cabinet minister would be the other members of the selection committee which will make the final selection so former chief election commissioners have pointed out that look this is also problematic you know the cabinet secretary when he's preparing the shortlist he would essentially be preparing a shortlist of these people or whoever is eventually selected would be the cabinet secretary's equal and they said that this again would be a strange peculiarity it would kind of disrupt or vitiate the working equation the election commissioner and the cabinet secretary could not be considered as equals especially given that at some point the election commissioner will want maybe there would be a situation where they may want explanations may expect the cabinet secretary or the law secretary to fall in line and that it would be again difficult for them to have that implemented if their service conditions and consequently their status is equal to that of the cabinet secretary okay so the salary aspect is one part of it even though it's not going to change that much but what you're saying is that because of this change in pecking order it would impact how seriously election commissioners are taken you're right the short answer is that yes this would affect the perception the authority the stature of the commission and in fact at the end of the day how seriously it is taken by the government by the political class and the executive right and could you talk about how the election commissioners have reacted to this bill so of course i mean they they have expressed reservation of record but what we have learned is now i mean given that this bill is now slated for discussion and passage during the special session the five day special session which starts on monday this matter sort of acquired a sense of urgency in the sense that we've learned that the election commissioners in a very rare intervention have decided to come together and write to the prime minister advising the government against this that do not do this this would affect the future election commissioners by the way of course any law that is implemented will not be effective retrospectively so this may not affect the incumbent chief election commissioner and the two who have been appointed before this but it would affect all future election commissioners and eventually diminish the authority of the election commission so they are planning to write we've learned that at least 3 to 4 election commissioners have, have signed this letter this communication is in its final stages and will be sent across to the prime minister essentially urging the government to maintain status quo and not revise the service conditions of the election commissioners 
And Ritika, do we know what the government makes of these concerns and criticisms? As of now, there hasn't been any official reaction from the government to all of these concerns. Off record, rather, you know, government officers have briefed reporters and said that they feel that these concerns are misplaced. And their logic is that, A, the salaries are still the same, which of course, by the way, is not a concern for former CECs. But they're saying that, you know, as far as stature or status is concerned, you know, that will not change because we are not amending the table of precedence. Now, basically, table of precedence is a protocol list at official ceremonies. This protocol list is looked at and followed while deciding mostly the seating arrangement, sort of who sits first. So the president obviously, you know, tops this protocol list. And on the table of precedence, the Supreme Court judges are at serial number nine and this chief election commissioner is at serial number nine A, which effectively means that when it comes to seating, they're both equals. Now, this table of precedence, like I mentioned, is meant for ceremonial purposes. It doesn't really have an impact or any use in day-to-day transactions of the government. But the government saying that, you know, we will maintain this table of precedence and which should be enough to signal that their status has not been downgraded, that they continue to enjoy the status, stature of the Supreme Court judge, and that this is enough to signal that we have just changed their service conditions, maybe their post-retirement benefits, and that is it, and that too much should not be read into it. That's the government's stand, but I don't think former CECs are convinced because, like I mentioned earlier, the table of precedence is used for purposes of seating most of the time. And it is felt that as far as transacting or discharging its functions concerned, you know, the election commissioners that Conditions of Service Act of 1991 and its language and where it specifies that their service conditions are equal to that of the Supreme Court, that is more important because that signals that their status is equal to a Supreme Court judge and that should not be changed. Dear listeners, before we continue with today's show, a quick word from our sponsors, DW, Deutsche Welle. In a country like ours, the pressure from our parents and those around us can often affect our decisions. Our dreams can often take a back seat. Though there are a few among us who dare to ask, what if I followed my dreams instead? Tune into the second season of DW's show, Choices, Dare to Dream, where six individuals meet their role models and turn their dreams into reality like Akanksha, who is secretly pursuing her true passion. Rap, can Kambhari help? Or Ketan, an e-commerce stylist who teams up with Payal Singhal to chase his dreams of dressing A-list celebrities in a Parisian fashion show. To know if Akanksha and Ketan could turn their dreams into reality, click on the link in the description to watch DW Choices, currently streaming on Geo Cinema. Don't miss out and remember, dare to dream. Now on with the show. And next, we talk about the ties between India and Saudi Arabia. Last weekend, the Saudi Crown Prince and Prime Minister Mohammed bin Salman visited India for the G20 Leaders Summit. And after the summit concluded, the Crown Prince stayed back for a state visit where he and Prime Minister Modi co-chaired the first meeting of the India-Saudi Arabia Strategic Partnership Council, which was established in 2019. During the meeting, the two countries signed eight agreements and over two dozen MOUs in areas including trade, anti-corruption, information technology and human resources. And what's worth noting is that this was not the first time that such deals had been signed between the two countries. According to Indian Express's diplomatic editor Shubhjit Roy, India and Saudi Arabia have a long history of cooperation dating back to 1947, with the most significant shift in their relationship occurring in 2006. When then King of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, he came to India in January 2006. And that is seen to be a watershed moment in the relationship. I mean, that visit resulted in the signing of the Delhi Declaration, which was followed in 2010 by the Riyadh Declaration. That sort of elevated the bilateral relations to what is called the strategic partnership. He says later on, in April 2016, when PM Modi visited the country, King Salman conferred him with Saudi Arabia's highest civilian honour, indicating the importance the country attached to its relationship with India. 
and since then the crown prince has visited india on multiple occasions shubhaji tells us about his trip to india in february 2019 if you remember february 2019 his visit happened just days after the pulwama terror attack and in which saudi arabia actually gave a very strong statement against terrorism and uh, at that point of time they announced that kingdom would invest approximately 100 billion dollar in india there were about six half a dozen mous were signed following that you know later that year in october 2019 Prime Minister Modi he visited Riyadh again, and during that visit, the Strategic Partnership Council, which is called the SPC, agreement was signed. So essentially, to establish this high-level council to steer the Indo-Saudi partnership, and it was this council that held its first leaders' meeting earlier this month, co-chaired by Prime Minister Modi and the Saudi Crown Prince. Now Shubhajit says that the cooperation between Saudi Arabia and India is primarily based on four pillars: energy cooperation, defense, people-to-people relations, and most crucial of all, economy. India is Saudi Arabia's second largest trading partner, and uh, Saudi Arabia is India's fourth largest trading partner. So the bilateral trade is last financial year. I think it was valued at about a little over fifty-two billion dollars, and the trade with Saudi Arabia accounted for almost four and a half percent of India's total trade in last financial year. You know, this particular during this visit, the both sides sort of took stock of the trade ties, and they noted that the bilateral trade has actually increased by with a growth of more than twenty-three percent, which is almost a quarter of year-on-year growth. In fact he says that as of January last year more than 2700 Indian companies have registered as joint ventures or 100% owned entities in the country with their total investment amounting to more than 2 billion dollars and similarly Saudi direct investments in India amounted to 3 billion dollars as of March 2022 and among the proposed investments include a 44 billion refinery petrochemical project in maharashtra which is being jointly done by saudi aramco abu dhabi national oil company and an indian consortium that includes indian oil corporation hindustan petroleum corporation and bharat petroleum corporation so there is a very strong economic investment trade linkage between the two countries in the last uh, several years Now when talking about Mohammed bin Salman's latest visit to India its most important outcome was the announcement of the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor that attempts to link India to Europe via West Asia This is a massive infrastructure project that could rival China's Belt and Road Initiative which aims to connect Asia Europe and Africa So this is a very ambitious project right now and the broad contours have been sort of laid out but the specifics need to be fleshed out now and uh, if this particular project comes to life is actually implemented it is expected to save on the time that takes right now and it is seen as an alternative to the uh, current suez canal that it operates and uh, which is the considered the current route to take india's sort of goods products to europe or on the other way around so that's how the corridor has been framed and it would obviously would mean more economic connectivity and that would obviously be lay a, lay a strong foundation for more uh, stronger economic ties now apart from economic ties india and saudi arabia's cooperation as we mentioned earlier also depends on the defense partnership which has grown stronger in the recent years through naval exercises and capacity building and shubhajit says that their ties are also made strong by the presence of the indian diaspora in the kingdom as you know indian community in the entire region is about uh, 9 million which is about 80 to 90 lakh in saudi arabia alone there are more than 24 lakh people 2.4 million and the widely respected for its contribution to the development of saudi arabia seen as a living bridge between the two countries in fact joint statement said that the indian side thanked the saudi government for taking 
care of the Indian diaspora in the kingdom. In fact, he points out that recently, when India had to evacuate its citizens from Sudan, it had taken help from Saudi Arabia to do so. However, as the relationship between India and Saudi Arabia strengthens, concerns have been raised regarding the reputation of the Saudi Crown Prince, with allegations of intolerance towards critics and human rights violations. And Shubhajit also points out that over the last few years, the 38-year-old Crown Prince has further consolidated his power. After being named the Prime Minister, which is a post traditionally held by the King, the Crown Prince has become the numero uno power in Saudi Arabia. Now, he has laid out a plan which is called Vision 2030, where he's positioned himself as Saudi Arabia's reformer-in-chief. He's uh, made significant changes in his country's ultra-conservative society, where women have got the right to drive, the cinemas are opening, foreign tourists are being welcomed. But obviously, he has a reputation of, for being ruthless with his critics. As many of you would recall, the Crown Prince has been accused by the US intelligence of having ordered the killing of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who had been a critic of the Saudi rulers. But Shubhajit says that despite these allegations, Mohammed bin Salman has interacted with various key geopolitical players to increase the significance of Saudi Arabia in the world. This includes China, Iran, Israel, US and of course India. So these are the impact that he has had. But obviously we have to see he's still young and we have to see how his these characteristics of, on the one hand, he wants to give Saudis prosperous future, but has also shown intolerance towards his critics. So these characteristics will likely guide his actions in the future. And finally, we talk about a controversial betting app and a lavish wedding. For quite some time now, the Enforcement Directorate has been trying to get a hold of the two main promoters of the Mahadev online gambling app. The promoters, Saurabh Chandrakar and Ravi Uppal, both of whom hail from Chhattisgarh, are accused of money laundering. When we spoke to Indian Express's Jay Prakash Naidu, he told us about the Mahadev app. So as per ED, this Mahadev online booking app, it provides for illegal betting in different live games like cricket and other sports. And it is also allowing people to place bets on different elections in India. And apart from this, they also allow you know users to play several card games like Teen Patti, Poker, etc. The app was founded around 2019, but its popularity grew during the pandemic. Here, Jayaprakash tells us how this app is different from the other betting apps in the country. So I did ask this question to the Chhattisgarh police as well as the ED. Chhattisgarh police official told me that, you know, there's a difference between app where, you know, it is more based on luck and less based on skill. He was saying that the other apps which are, you know, being endorsed by celebrities, it is more of a skill game where you, you know, showcase your skills and win money. And this is, you know, like betting on cricket games, on live games where, you know, uh, it is more of a chance than a skill. And when I put the same question to the ED, they said that this Mahadev app is illegal because all the money transactions are happening through Hawala transactions and all the Hawala money is being used to buy properties and whatnot. For those of you who may not know, Hawala transactions are off the books cash transactions that do not involve the physical movement of money. These transactions, of course, are done without using the banking systems and are illegal in India. And he also gave an example that for other popular apps, money transfer will happen through Western Union money transfer and other legal banking transaction channels. But for this uh, Mahadev app, all the banking transactions were through Hawala, which is termed illegal. Now, the Enforcement Directorate is investigating money laundering charges of an estimated 5,000 crore rupees in connection with this app. During its investigation, the ED discovered that Vikas Chhaparia, an individual based in Kolkata, allegedly managed all the Hawala-related operations of the Mahadev app. The agency conducted searches at his premises and those of his associates. However, the app's two main promoters, Chandrakar and Uppal, who are currently residing in the UAE, have so far managed to evade arrest. 
दो जयप्रकाश सेज दट द ई डी इज एक्टिवली ट्राइंग टू नैप दम द ई डी हैज इनिशिएटेड द प्रोसेस ऑफ इशूइंग अ रेड कॉर्नर नोटिस अगेंस्ट दैम सो दैट दे कैन बी एक्सडाइटेड फ्रॉम द यू ए Now, despite being under ED scanner, one detail that really stands out in this case is that one of the promoters of the app, Saurabh Chandrakar, is said to have spent two hundred crore rupees on his lavish wedding in the UAE back in February. Jay Prakash told us how the ED found out about the wedding. Recently, the marriage video got leaked, where you can see fifteen to sixteen popular celebrities from the Hindi film industry performing. Now, this includes uh, film and TV actors, actresses, singers, music composers, and even comedians. Apart from a star-studded lineup of celebrity performances, ED found out that Chandrakar also managed to fly down his family members in private planes. So now the question was, how did he manage to pay for all of this? Well, the ED believes that here as well, hawala channels were used to make cash payments. So they paid the entire money to the celebrities through hawala transactions. Now ED will find out if the celebrities took the money in cash or online payment, and of course, who made them the payment and how the celebrities came in touch with these alleged scamsters. The ED has also said that it has evidence to show that hundred and twelve crore rupees were allegedly delivered via hawala transactions. to an event management company in mumbai for chandrakar's wedding and hotel bookings worth 42 crore rupees were made in the uae using the local currency the law enforcement agency has conducted searches at 39 locations across raipur bhopal mumbai and kolkata so far during the initial stages of its investigation jayaprakash tells us that the ed became suspicious that instead of shutting down the illegal betting racket The Chhattisgarh police had a role to play in keeping it going. Now ED says that it was the Chhattisgarh police who was allowing this punters of Mahadev app to operate and they were taking a bribe in return. ED has also arrested a low rank cop from the Chhattisgarh police who is said to have acted as a mediator between the kingpins in UAE and Chhattisgarh police and this low rank cop has also allegedly passed on 65 crores to government officials including senior police officials in Chhattisgarh. as per the ed remand copy but despite all this pressure from indian investigation agencies the mahadev app continues to thrive and attract users so what the chatisgarh police are saying is it's difficult to stop the app completely because even if you take it off the google play store the punters can simply send the app's file through whatsapp telegram and other similar mediums but they do say that the operations have really come down since the raids took place and now that the ed came into the picture you were listening to three things by the indian express today's show was produced by me shashank bhargav utsha sarman and rahil philippos and was edited and mixed by suresh pawar if you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts you can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it share it with a friend or someone in your family it's the best way for people to get to know about us you can tweet us at express podcast and write to us at podcast@indianexpress.com at